you know, read it if you have not otherwise done so. You're bound by it regardless. In terms of you know, meetings, please sign in to the Meet Echo Lite using the you know, code that's on the screen here. This is partially how we register things in place of the prior blue sheets. And more importantly, it's used to help us figure out how big of a room we get. Um, in terms of remote uh, participants, uh, if we had a chance for you to, to do audio, so hopefully things go smoothly afterwards, uh, please consider using a headset if you can. A couple of the common resources. And here's you know, our agenda, page through it uh, briefly. We'll be doing the chair summary on the Friday session to try to actually keep today packed as well as we can. Okay. So first session. Okay, Shri Hari, I believe you're ready to go. All right, can you hear me, Jeff? You're loud and clear. All right, good. Good morning, folks. Um, this presentation is about um, how do we bring in generic metric extensions uh, for BGP. And uh, uh, I've presented this in the last IETF as well as the interim, and this is an incremental update. I'm gonna give uh, some background information as well. My name is Srihari Sangli. Uh, I'm from Juniper Networks, and I'm presenting this on behalf of my co-authors. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, this is the agenda. I'm going to give a recap, a quick recap of the problem statement, uh, and then propose the generic metric, how we can introduce this in BGP, um, and some deployment considerations and uh, next steps. All right. So. Um, we are talking about what operators can do by offering an intent-based end-to-end path. Um, uh, this is a domain with multiple AS domains uh, uh, interconnected as a, in a common administrative domain. Um, for these intent, intent can be expressed via many different metrics, uh, not just the default IGP, but uh, the delay, bandwidth, and maybe administratively assigned uh, new metric types. Um, we have IGP uh, metric registry defined, so it would be nice to have uh, alignment uh, to help operations in the network. This is uh, uh, was introduced in 7311 RFC way back um, with accumulated IGP, um, and and the 7311 introduced the EHB TLB. That's the only one TLB that it introduced, and uh, the definition back then was to carry the default IGP. Um, since then, there have been multiple interpretations of 7311. Uh, I had presented this in the previous uh, uh, sessions. Um, at the moment, what I would like to focus on in, and provide a thought uh, uh, for the entire work group is the AGP attribute um, suffers uh, the attribute scoping, um, which we have talked about in the previous sessions, uh, and uh, what called call is a metric discontinuity. Uh, so the proposal that I have for gener introducing generic metrics is to get around uh, this particular issue. Next slide. All right. So the generic metric extensions uh, can be encoded in this way. Um, it's a simple TLV uh, with the, any new metric type uh, and the value. Uh, it would be good to have a flags uh, introduced within it. Uh, and there may be some additional uh, uh, information that can be carried in these flags, like uh, is this metric path uh, discontinuous? Uh, if so, indicate the bit, uh, or has this uh, router normalized uh, if the local domain's um, um, uh, IGP or, or local domain's uh, metric is not what the intent metric is? So if so, has this normalized the uh, uh, local domain's uh, uh, metric type? Um, and the rest, rest of the bits is for reserve. Next slide. Yeah. Um, what we are going to talk about in this session is how generic metric can be extended in uh, uh, next top dependent capability attribute. Um, this generic metric TLV will be seen as a new capability in the NHC attribute, and the encoding is like this. Um, it will have a, it will get a new code. Um, and the data will be the previous slides uh, TLV of individual metrics. Uh, please note in the NHC attribute, one could carry multiple metric types uh, in the generic metric capability data. 
and uh, uh, NHC is defined uh, or described in that uh, draft IETF ID or entropy label. Next slide. All right. Why next stop dependent capability attribute? Um, in the past, uh, we had presented uh, if we have to carry this in AI GPA, what it would take, or if we have to bring in new attribute, uh, what are the issues, as well as NHC. Uh, but the proposal from all the co-authors uh, that I would like to present here is why have we chosen NHC? Uh, and here are the reasons. Um, First of all, the NHC is defined in this draft, uh, and, and it's a good thing to note that it provides the uh, next stop based attribute scoping. And uh, as it is defined, NHC is an optional transitive attribute. Uh, this helps in deployment uh, with uh, you know uh, minimal up, uh, upgrades as needed, uh, uh, and it has some operational benefits, right? So. Given the discontinuity um, uh, that I had described in the interim, um, just as a recap of that is, if any router along the path uh, does not understand um, a specific uh, metric that has been uh, originated by the uh, by the source, then um, the ingress router or the receiver of this uh, uh, met uh, of this route cannot determine that whether the router. Uh, uh, you know, updated or accumulated the uh, cost, or he that particular router did not understand, and therefore he did not uh, uh, um, add, or it may be added zero. Uh, one will not be able to indicate, and that is what we refer as a discontinuity. Um, and and we look at it as different forms of discontinuity in here. So if you go with the NHC attribute, it helps in you know bringing in the scope, and therefore we can determine the discontinuity. Right, and this discontinuity is in the end-to-end -end generic metric uh, that has been defined. Right, so the first-order discontinuity is uh, the intermediate router does not even support the next uh, uh, capable dependent capability. Um, in which case, according to the draft, uh, you have to drop the NHC attribute, including all the contents. In which case, um, um, the generic metric will not be propagated, uh, but the receiving router will determine the next stop validation. This is according to the base uh, uh, idea or entropy label draft and therefore the receiving router will find out that uh, uh, there has been a you know a router that does not understand uh, the second case is let's say the router supports the next stop dependent capability but is not yet uh, supporting uh, the generic metric uh, uh, capability uh, in which case uh, uh, it will drop the generic metric capability because uh, this is just the base NHC draft, in which case um, uh, um, one will find out that this path uh, uh, is not even uh, supporting the new intent. Uh, uh, so it's going to be clear on the ingress. The third is, let's say the router supports the NHC uh, and also generic metric capability, um, but then uh, some of the new metric types that may have been introduced in the future is not supported. Uh, but the NHC supports the base NHC. Um, base NHC supports an ability for the intermediate router to refresh or reconstruct the capabilities, and that's where we are using that uh, uh, flexibility to propagate the discontinuity information. Next slide. Okay, and and if you have to leverage NHC, and these are the ways. Um, given that intent is expressed via one or more metric types. Um, and and this is a metric value that is referenced uh, for during the next stop reachability uh, evaluation or uh, when we do the cumulative uh, cost computation. So in that sense, uh, if there is a next stop change, uh, naturally there will be metric uh, change as well. So therefore, I think it makes sense to use this uh, uh, NHC uh, option. Uh, just as a recap for the NHC procedures. Uh, in, in in these four simple steps, that's the recap of the uh, entire procedure. So the originator of the route encodes uh, the capabilities and and uh, it advertises. It also adds in the advertised next stop in the NHC. Uh, along the along the path, the non-originator, which does not modify the next stop, it will just propagate all the NHC capabilities. Um, and if the intermediate router uh, does not uh, or it it modifies the next stop. Uh, in which case it updates uh, the new next stop that it's going to advertise and reconstructs the attribute uh, with uh, refreshing all the capabilities. Uh, so at the end, when the ingress router or the receiver, when it accepts the route, um, it will validate the next stop in the NHC field. And, and if it is equal to the advertised next stop, then it accepts it. 
and then it processes all the capabilities. Next slide. Okay, so mapping the generic metric capability, um, and these are the next two slides, just talk about all the procedures. At the originator, uh, like the NHC, we add the next stop, and we also add the generic metric capability, uh, including all the metrics that the intent uh, is going to be expressed as. Uh, here, the, the, D, the bit D on the metric flags is zero, and also the N is zero. Along the path, let's say there's a non-originator, the intermediate router that does not modify the next stop, it will just propagate NHC as is, uh, no changes here, even for the generic metric capability. Next slide. Yeah, so, and, and if we have an intermediate router that does modify the next stop, um, uh, like in the defining the NHC, it updates the next stop field. And uh, it what we are recommending is, uh, we it has to retain the entire generic metric capability and all the metric types. Um, only then the ingress order will find out what has been sent uh, as the intent. Um, and for each unrecognized uh, uh, you know, metric type, let's say some of the metric types are recognized, some of them are unrecognized. So for each of the unrecognized metric type, uh, the D bit has to be set to one uh, for that particular metric type. And uh, this is what we call as the sort of the, what we represented in the previous slides as a discontinuous uh, path of the third order. Uh, the only way to deal with it is at some point of time, um, uh, uh, you know, the ingress has to figure out uh, as to what, uh, how to deal with this, uh, because there is a router that does not understand this new metric type, so, uh, which I can cover in the next set of slides. For each recognized metric type, um, it will have to go look at, um, uh, you know, uh, if my local domain matches with the TLB metric type, then uh, as per the 7311, uh, very similar uh, logic can be used, which is, you add the local cost to the next stop and add it to the TLB's metric and then use it. If it does not match, uh, the uh, the local domain metric type does not match with the TLB's metric type, then you have to normalize the uh, uh, local cost to the to match with the TLB's metric type and then you accumulate it. And because you've normalized, you set the bit N uh, to one um, uh, in the TLB's, in that particular TLB's metric flags. Next slide. Sure, you're here near the end of your time slot. Okay, I'm gonna just wrap it up. So the receiver uh, is going to be very clear. So we talked about this. Uh, uh, next stop field, if it is not equal, uh, then uh, entire uh, gender metric is ignored. And um, if it is equal to that, what is next stop? Then um, it, you just follow what the uh, uh, um, uh, 7311 procedures are. So um, uh, for the best path competition, so uh, you add it to the next stop local cost and then use it, or uh, you normalize and then use it. So if you have to re-advertise, you follow the previous slide. Next slide. Okay. From a deployment considerations, uh, we would require NHC to be deployed because scoping check is re scoping check is required. And um, if there is a path which has uh, the regular IGP uh, uh, AGP carried as well as the uh, generic metric carried in this, uh, both can be compared. Um, and then um, the router that modifies the next stop, uh, uh, it has to reconstruct the NHC. So this is how the uh, entire end-to-end uh, -end intent is propagated. And the ingress router, when it receives, uh, it, if it hand, if it sees a discontinuous path, either it can discard or put some low preference or a pipe breaker. Next slide. Uh, would like work group to provide comments and uh, would like uh, uh, chairs to see whether this can be adopted because now we, we believe this problem has been solved and uh, we have a credible solution. Thank you, Shuhari. Uh, we have very limited time, maybe one question if there's any. Uh, aside from that, uh, please send the adoption request to the mailing list so this can get to discussed uh, where everybody can see it. Uh, second of all, I would like to request that people who have comments in the proposal split your comments in two lines. Uh, one line of thought is, uh, you know, are you happy with the encapsulation of the next stop capability? And the second one is comment specifically on the generic metric itself. There are no questions in the room. Thank, Thank you, you. Sherry. Our next presentation will be on the MPBGP extensions for IPv4 v6 mapping advertisements. Uh, Xing Li will be presenting. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Xing Li from Tsinghua University, CERNET. And uh, 
I will present this. Actually, this is the first version of the after working group adoption MBGP extension. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, actually this document defined uh, MPBGP extensions, we call six map, four six map. And uh, actually it's from different, a little bit different from the original proposal. Currently that's the idea of define a SAFI and uh, some details. I will a little bit explain this in the next couple of slides. So that's basically, next slide, please. So the basic idea is we are working on transition technologies. No matter it's encapsulation or translation or double translation, it's basically in a single atomic system or domain. However, for example, there are cases like multiple atomic system operators, for example, China Telecom and CERNET. And uh, so if without interdomain or BGP, things in the border probably we need to translate back to from V4 to V6 and the, on the border of IPv6 peering, translate back to V4 in order to maintain the AS origin or those kind of attributes. And then to the next atomic system, translate back to V6, all those kind of things. So actually this proposal is trying to, in the control plane, so keep all the attributes of the IPv4. However, in the data plane, everything is IPv6. So that's basically the idea of V4 network one and the V4 network two. And uh, in within adopt, Atomic system translate to V6 and in the border still keep V6 and those kinds of whatever it's a P router or P router, those kind of things. So next slide, please. And currently actually we are using the IPv6 alpha and however define a SAFA as called six map, four map six SAFA. Basically that's the NRR information is the V6 prefix length, V6 prefix V4 address prefix length and V4 address prefix. So that's basically the definition of data structure of the SAFA. Next slide, please. And uh, however, because we need some additional information. So we, in this version, that's the TRV <coughs> play the job. So that's the internal types and the length and the value. So for example, the address origin type and the forwarding type, those kind of things. So basically that's the idea. Original, we propose uh, some attributes, but in the current version after discussion, it's deleted. So next slide, please. And the revision. So this list the details of the revision after the previous IETF 117. So actually first we like to emphasize that's the control the environment. So in order not to mess up the global IPv6 routing table, those kind of things. And also, as I mentioned earlier, the distance metrics has been removed. And this, so corresponding things we were modified and actually it's modified already in the current version, IETF working group version 00. zero. And uh, so next slide, please. And uh, also that's the, there, there are some development operational considerations because that's something new, cross domain IPv6 only, but maintain the IPv4 BGP attributes. So those kind of things probably make us clear explains simpler and make people understand. So that's the session added. Next slide, please. Oh, okay. So we acknowledge and thanks Jeff, especially in the, all the comments received from the mailing list. And uh, that's great. Next slide, please. So comments and suggestions are welcome. and. Uh, we will take further refinements of this draft. Thank you very much. Any questions? Questions in the room or online?
there appear to be no questions. Thank you for the presentation. Oh, actually, Thank you. Sue, did you have something? Oh. I sent some comments online, but your oh, co-authors, yeah. no. Yeah, yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so actually, there is a question on, uh, via chat from Andrew, our you know, outgoing AD. Uh, you know, and this is not a question that deserves a strong answer, but uh, he's wondering why IDR rather than BESS? Do you have uh, specific opinions about that as uh, authors? Well, do you have some comments, my cause? And, and this can go to the mailing list, certainly, if you don't want to uh, answer in room. Yeah, Dr. She from China Telecom. The call. Yeah. China Telecom. I think we can discuss this in the mini Okay. Yeah, it's been adopted as an IDR draft. It just was a question online. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Next presentation is for Yao. Hello everyone, Yalu from ZT. I'm presenting this draft uh, on behalf of my co-authors. Next, please. And here's here's a quick recap. And currently, and when delivering SR policy via BGP, SR algorithm can be optionally specified in all the segment sub TLVs except for those uh, for SMPRS adjacency sets. And uh, uh, we have an uh, RSR working uh, group draft uh, claims that the algorithm can also be included as part of an uh, adjacency set, uh, SRMPRS adjacency set uh, in IGP. So uh, this document defines new segment set tier types to provide optional algorithm for SRMPRS adjacency sets when delivering SR policy via BGP. And although we get some uh, reviews and comments and supports, but it didn't pass the working group adoption call last year because there has not been enough interest on the list. Uh, next, please. And here's uh, the main updates and discussions. And I would like to thank Kirtan and Nat, Zheng Chang, and Jian for their helpful comments and their suggestions uh, since last adoption call. And the main updates are uh, Jian has joined as a co-author and uh, the references to other documents have been updated and corrected. And uh, the main discussions uh, is first proposed by Zheng Chang, uh, uh, it's mainly about other remote node address interface required for segment type error, which is defined for IPv4 a numbered link. And uh, uh, thanks for Katyn's help and the discussion uh, with us offline. And the answer uh, is not necessary uh, because an IPv4 a numbered link has to be a point to point link. So uh, the local information is enough and uh, uh, this draft should keep, keep aligned with segment types uh, in SR policy architecture and in the SR sector uh, and the existing working group draft. So we keep uh, only the local information as they defined. Next, please. And uh, here are the new segment uh, sub TLVs. Basically, uh, there are uh, existing sub TLVs plus the optional algorithm. So, um, next, please. And uh, next, so I'm not going to skip it. So uh, we request for more interest, review, and comments, and we're preparing so for the second working group adoption. And uh, sorry, so I didn't know test your comment until just now. So that's okay. I'll I'll repeat them for for the audience here, and they're more about the context. Uh, SR segments, which this is uh, going beyond is an experimental draft because our ID found that it was, uh, there was no implementation. So my questions were about planned implementations. Uh, do you have any implementations planned? Do you have any use cases you'd like to share information about? Okay, uh, uh, we didn't implement this uh, seven types in our draft, but the original ones we are, we have some undergoing implementations. So 
which is the segment G. Uh, uh, actually, uh, if you have ongoing implementations mm -hmm. on the existing ones, do send me a note uh, okay. because that will help that uh, earlier draft on segment types. If you are planning implementations or if you have details, if you just drop a little bit of note to the working group okay. about it, okay. that would happen. Um, okay. uh, Thank you very much. Okay, we, we have some ongoing implementation. I can send it to, or next week I can go back to check, double yeah. check, so how that it- would, That would be really good, thank okay. you. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, next presentation segment, routing BGP egret APE over L2 bundles. Meng Xiao. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Meng Xiao Chen from New H3C Technologies. On behalf of my co authors, I will give this presentation about segment routing BGP EPE over layer 2 bundle. Next slide, please. Uh, this draft was per first presented at 118 meeting. We are glad to have Katrin, uh, Katrin join us as a co author. Uh, we have made the following changes. We think there is no need to define new BGP peering segment type for layer 2 bundle member because the definition of peer JSON seed is not restricted to layer, two, layer 3 interface. Uh, for MPRS SR, we reuse the existing uh, peer JSON seed TRV for bundle members instead of defining new TRV. Uh, we rewrite section 3 to make the BGPRS advertisements more concise. concise. Uh, we move the example to appendix. Uh, next slide, please. There are deployments where BGP session is established on layer 2 bundle. In the example network, the operator of AS1 wishes to apply a BGP EP policy to steal the time sensitive traffic from AS1 to AS2 via member link 1 uh, because the member link 1 has the lowest delay. Uh, to meet such requirement, uh, BGP peering seeds need to be allocated to individual bundle member links and the advertisement of such BGP peering seeds in BGPRS is required. Next slide, please. Uh, when a BGP peer session is established over a layer 2 bundle, an implementation may allocate one or more peer adjacency segments for each member link. If so, it should advertise those EPCs in BGPRS using the method defined in this document. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide describes the advertisement of peer adjacency seeds of the bundle members in BGPRS. Uh, for SR and PRS, uh, uh, RFC 9086 uh, describes the BGPRS advertisement of the peer adjacency seed for layer 3 link. In order to advertise the peer adjacency seed for uh, layer 2 bundle members in BGPRS, uh, the layer 2 bundle member attributes TRV must also be included in the link attributes. Uh, each TRV identifies a layer 2 bundle member and includes the peer adjacency seed TRV to advertise the EPE seed for the associated layer 2 bundle member. Uh, this draft updates RFC 9085 and RFC 9086 to allow the peer adjacency seed TRV to be included as a sub TRV of the layer 2 bundle member attributes TRV. For SRV6, according to RFC 9514, the advertisement of layer 3 link BGP EP peer adjacency seed is the same as for uh, MPRS SR. Uh, except for using the SRV6 and the XC the TRV instead of the peer adjacency C the TRV. Uh, so we just need to use the SRV6 and XC the TRV carried in the L2 bundle member uh, attributes TRV to advertise the SRV6 EPC for bundle members. 
uh, it should be noted that the inclusion of a uh, layer two bundle member attributes TLV implies that the identified member link is up. If any member link fails, the L2 bundle member attributes TLV must be withdrawn along with uh, the associated uh, peer agency seed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next step, we would like to ask for working group adoption. Any questions or comments are welcomed. Thank you for your presentation. Are there questions in the room or online? And while we're waiting for the queue to form, a question of my own. Uh, it is sometimes the case that layer two bundle members are inconsistently addressable in uh, various implementations. Do you have any concerns about this being a general purpose feature based on those types of issues that we've seen in the past? Uh. Uh, thank you for your question. I will think it over and uh, send my response to the mail list. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Ketan. Uh, hi, uh, Jeff. Uh, this is to answer uh, your question. Uh, the addressability is not, I mean, it's using uh, IDs. Uh, and uh, there is uh, some work that's happening in uh, LSR uh, from where this information is sourced. Uh, to learn the local and remote IDs. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's probably more a question uh, on the underlying IGPs than uh, BGPLS here. Yeah, in my case, this is more a question of uh, forwarding behaviors, just simply because uh, you know, bundle behaviors are intentionally left uh, up to implementations by AAA. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, true. Uh, so on that front, uh, the the use case here is to uh, steer over specific uh, bundle members, bypassing the normal load balancing characteristics. Uh, at least that's the use case. We can clarify it in the draft. Okay. Thank you for answering my question. I see. Oh, sorry, Sue. I'm next. This is simply a reminder before you do working group adoption, since you've stated that this modifies two of the other RFCs, you need to put that in the header before I do adoption. Thank you. All right, I think we have a question from Xi. Xi uh, from Huawei, uh, a quick comment. I just uh, give a quick uh, uh, view of, uh, about the RFC 1985 and, and 1986. I think the 1985, uh, the PR adjacent seed has been included as a sub TRV for the link, uh, L2 bundle member TRV, if I didn't make mistake. Is it already defined there? Uh, no, I, I think uh, it cannot be included as, as a sub TRV because it is uh, 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 defined as a, a link uh, uh, is used in the uh, link NLRI, not in the attributes. Uh, maybe I, can, I need to double check. Okay. Okay. There are no further questions in queue. So, Meng Zhao, next uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Meng Zhao again. Uh, I will continue to give another presentation about BGP extensions of SR policy for head end behavior. Uh, this is the first time this draft is presented in the working group. Uh, next slide, please. RFC uh, 8986 uh, defines four types of SRV6 policy head end behaviors. Uh, the H in caps behavior means that uh, when the head end node uh, steals a packet into the SRv6 policy, it will push an IPv6 header with its own SRH uh, carrying the uh, segment list of SRv6 policy. Uh, the second uh, uh, H in caps reduce behavior is an optimization of uh, the H in caps behavior. Uh, it reduces the length of the SRH by excluding the first seed in the SRH of the outer uh, IPv6 header. Uh, the first seed is only placed in the destination area address field. Uh, the uh, H in caps layer two and the H in caps layer two re reduce are the corresponding behaviors for layer two frames. Uh, in addition, 
uh, there is also a draft which defines the uh, H insert headed behaviors. Using the BGP protocol is a very popular way to distribute SR policies from a controller to a head end. The SRv6 binding seed sub tier V can be attached to advertise the binding seed and its behavior, which determines the head end behavior for packets stilled by that binding seed. Uh, however, a uh, head end can steal a packet flow into an SR policy in many other ways. Uh, such as uh, per destination steering, uh, per flow steering, uh, policy based steering, and so on. Uh, so the, the network operator has to use additional tools to signal the head end behavior. Uh, this document defines extensions for BGP SR policy to specify the head end behavior. Next slide, please. Two new sub tier Vs are defined. Uh, they are used for layer 3 traffics and the layer 2 traffics, respectively. Uh, they are both optional sub-tier V and must not appear more than once in the SR policy coding. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this, this slide shows the format of head-end behavior sub-tier V. Uh, it encodes the default head-end behavior for layer 3 traffic. In the case of binding seed steering, the behavior defined by the binding seed overrides the default uh, head end behavior. Four values of head end behavior field are currently defined. Uh, they are specified by RFC uh, 80, 89 and 8986 and the, the insertion draft. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the uh, format of layer two head end behavior sub tier V. Uh, it encodes the uh, default head end behavior for layer two traffic. Uh, two values are, uh, cu are currently defined, which are specified by RFC uh, 80, 8986. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next step, we are going to add corresponding uh, extensions for BGPRS. Uh, any questions or comments are welcome. Thank you. Jeff, would you go back to slide four? I note that uh, the head and insert uh, behaviors are still in the Phil Spring SRV6. What's the status of that draft? Is it gone into adoption call or is it still uh, being discussed? Uh, uh. Uh, what I can see about the status of this draft, uh, uh, it is currently expired. I think uh, uh, it is still in discussion. Okay. So uh, if you're basically building on that as your basis for your work, uh, that document also needs to move forward as well. So my suggestion is uh, have conversations with those authors. Uh oh, thank you. Okay. We have time for maybe one additional question. Okay, thank you for the presentations. Ran Chen, you're up next. Afternoon, everyone. I'm Ran from ZTE. Uh, today, I would like to talk about uh, BGPRS as, as a policy for NRP on behalf of all the co authors. Next, please. And segment routing policy defined in RFC 9256 is an ordered list of, segment, uh, of segments that represent a source routed policy. And the draft uh, ITF uh, net selects introduced the concept network resource position, which is a subset of the resources and associated policies in the underlay network. As a policy, uh, NRP defines the extension to BGP as a policy to specify the NRP which the as a policy currently pass is associated with. And the draft uh, BGP as a policy describes a mechanism to distribute as a policy information to external components using BGPRS. Uh, this document defines a new TLV which enables the, the headache to report the configuration and the states of the NRP. 
it's as a policy can be passed is associated with that space. Um, in this draft, we defined a new as a policy state TLV called NRP TLV to carry the NRP with as a policy can be passed is associated with. Uh, this is the format of the NRP TLV for NRP ID field. Uh, it's four octet uh, domain significant at the value of NRP uh, resource partitions. Next, please. Uh, this is the procedures uh, as a policy can be passed, may be instantiated with a specific RP on the hand aid node uh, via a local configuration. Then the state of the attributes of the RP associated with the can be passed of as a policy are uh, encoded in the BGPRS attribute field as as a policy uh, state TLA. The SR policy state TLV defined in draft PTPRS as policy are not changed to report the SR policy can be pass a state and attribute. And in this document, we only defined the new SR policy TLV and RP TLV to report the state of the NRP. Next, please. Uh, based on the mail list, uh, we update our draft. Uh, the following are the main changes of the uh, new version. Uh, updated in RPTLV format based on RFC 9552, update the references to RFC 9552, update the scalability consideration section uh, to be consistent, consistent with draft as a policy in RP and after, uh, update the terminology uses in yeah, the consideration section. Next, please. Uh, this mechanism is uh, uh, straightforward and uh, uh, now I think it is very, uh, it is uh, stable. So uh, we want, uh, we would like to uh, call for adoption, ask a working group to call for adoption. Uh, comments, welcome, thanks. Thank you. And Ketan, you're the first in the queue. Uh, hi, uh, Ketan Talaulikar, Cisco. Uh, a question whether uh, the supporting uh, spring document that uh, indicates how NRP is used uh, or what is the applicability of NRP for an SR policy, uh, has that work been done in spring? Uh, can you uh, repeat again? Uh, so the uh, so what this draft does is it is reporting the NRP associated with an SR policy candidate path via BGPLS. However, my question is whether the base applicability or use of NRP with SR policies uh, has that work been done in Spring Working Group? Uh, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm not uh, sure. I can uh, drop an email on the mailing list. Uh, uh, um, I want to, uh, oh. sorry. Uh, okay, uh, Robin from Huawei. Okay, now I'm not sure about this one. You talk about this uh, applicability, but this is a protocol extensions. Uh, I'm not sure what's your point. You mean so this should to refer to the applicability in Spring Working Group? Uh, so SR policy is a construct uh, defined by Spring Working Group, right? Uh, what is what does it mean for NRP of an SR policy? How is it used in forwarding? Uh, you know those aspects need to be clarified in Spring, right? And then we can have protocol extensions for them in all other protocol working groups. Yeah, so okay. if if I can eject, Robin. So the, the general point that is uh, being made by Ketan and uh, was part of the prior comments, many of these extensions that we're discussing for BHBLS, including this one, are basically the glue encodings to allow a feature to find in another working group to get its job done. And uh, the sort of general request that we have uh, for IDR for taking on these works for BHBLS is making sure that the base work that's uh, starting from is active, uh, being developed, and that there's enough clarity in the Beach BLS document to say what functionality is being added in to glue stuff together, and if necessary, refer back to the document in the you know, working group like Spring as an example that defines how things work. 
Okay, I, I see. But uh, I mean, so this uh, related with the uh, network slicing, maybe this uh, has much relation with the teeth. Right, so in Ketan, uh, the, the work here, I think has been discussed in a tease context. Uh, the TEAS chairs are aware of this NRP related stuff, uh, and we are regularly asking them about uh, you know, whether the applicability is being appropriately met. So you know, there, there's some still bumpy pieces for that as the work is, uh, I guess, in TEAS still under refinement, which means that some of the BGBLS work is uh, early to be, uh, too early to be implemented, but we'll, we'll work these things through. Uh, if you do have a feedback, Robin, uh, or from the T's group, just have Robin or someone contact us and say, yep, this is ready to go. We're not trying to make a large hill to climb, just check in with the T's chairs. Uh, G's did that with yeah. his draft and it worked yeah. well. Okay. Yeah, this draft is consistent with his draft. Uh, I, I mean, I see she has uh, contact with the TIS. You, okay, I will check. Thank you. Thank you very much. And she's next for another presentation on NRP. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is uh, a draft about uh, using BGP link state for the advertisement of NRP information in a scalable way, yeah. Uh, I'm presenting on behalf of the co-authors. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, here's some background. I think just Ryan just mentioned some of this. NRP is a, a collection of network resources allocated on a set of links in the underlay network. And the NRP concept is introduced in this RFC, new RFC 9543 for the network slice framework. And NRP can be used as underlay network construct to support uh, enhanced VPN services or the network slice services. Um, uh, the topology and the resource attributes of the NRP is needs to be collected from the network and distributed to the network controller, either for the NRP specific pass competition or for NRP specific network management. And uh, as the number of NRPs increase, there may be concerns about the scalability in advertising NRP information using the control protocols. And this has been discussed in the TIS working group. Uh, we have a draft uh, called NRP scalability and it mentioned some of the concerns and also the suggestions about in the protocol designs. So this document uh, specifies uh, some BGP RS based mechanisms and uh, with some necessary extensions for the advertisement of NRP specific information in a scalable way. Okay, uh, next slide. So uh, here we list the two possible mechanisms uh, for the NRP information uh, advertisement. First, uh, firstly, we know that NRP can be usually created based on the partitioning of the link resources in the network. So there are, uh, we can see that there are two possible ways for the advertisement of the NRP specific link information uh, using BGPRS. The first approach is we can advertise NRP information as uh, link, uh, one type of link attributes uh, associated with the existing BGPRS link NRI. And this can be uh, easier to, with uh, minor extensions for the TLVs for the link attributes. However, uh, we see two issues when the number of NRP increases. Uh, the first is uh, when the amount of inf NRP information associated with the link will increase accordingly to the number of the NRPs and this will cause the uh, one BGP update message very large and may not be able to be accommodated in one single message. Uh, the second issue is uh, when the information of just the one NRP uh, need to be updated on the link. Uh, with, the, uh, with this approach, uh, the link NRI and all the associated link attributes including the attributes for the NRPs, for all the associated NRPs has to be updated together, which will result in unnecessary road advertisement. And so we consider maybe there's a better way is listed here as a second approach, which is a, to introduce a new NRI type in BGPRS uh, for the advertisement of NRP specific link information. And the attributes of each NRP can be advertised uh, and updated separately. 
So the scalability concerns in the first approach can be elevated. Okay, uh, next slide. So here are the proposed extensions to BGPRS. Basically, we need to introduce a new BGPRS NRI type for the advertisement of NRP specific uh, link information. The format is uh, shown here and the type is to be defined. Basically, it is, uh, NRI is uh, just uh, uh, based on the existing link NRI and we add a new NRP descriptor TLV. And in the NRP descriptor TLV, it contains uh, one or more NRP descriptor sub TLVs. Currently, we just defined one sub TLV called NRP ID, uh, which carries a 32 bit network wide identifier of the NRP. So, this is uh, the extension to the NRI part. Okay, next slide. And uh, correspondingly, we also introduced an um, extension to the attributes. Uh, some NRP attribute TLVs are used to carry the NRP specific uh, link attributes in the BGPRS attribute. Here we reuse one uh, existing uh, link attribute, which is the maximum link bandwidth uh, TLV. And we also propose to add two new uh, TLVs for the NRP information. Uh, the maximum link bandwidth TLV is used to advertise amount of uh, link bandwidth allocated to a NRP. And NRP hierarchy TLV is used to uh, indicate the level uh, to which the NRP belongs uh, in case there's hierarchical NRP uh, deployed on the, in the network. Another TLV is called the parent NRP TLV ID, which is uh, to carry the identifier of the parent NRP from which a hierarchical NRP is derived. And also here, we just list the basic NRP specific TLVs and other link attributes may also be used for NRP specific information advertisement. Okay, next slide. So uh, actually this is uh, the zero zero version of this document and we would like to collect the comments and feedbacks on this uh, approach and whether you think uh, the pro tool is better or whether you have a better suggestion. And then we can refine the document accordingly Okay. Gee, in your link, it said that it didn't fit in a BGP update. I take it that's the old, not yeah. the maximum size. Not the extended one. But not some, yeah. For some network, they may not uh, support the extended message. Hey, I got a quick question. Uh, there is a flex algo that allows you to slice a network if you want. Does this mechanism and I know what this mechanism is doing. My question is, does this mechanism work in conjunction with FlexAlgo or is it supposed to aid FlexAlgo or it is supposed to assume that it will work in scenarios where FlexAlgo is not present? Yeah, it's a good question. I think uh, uh, actually FlexAlgo can work together with this approach in my understanding because we can allow uh, a few FlexAlgos deployed in network and we have more than more NRPs a few NRPs may be associated with the, the same flash algo, that is for the topology information and for past computation, but still we need to uh, advertise NRP specific attributes, uh, at least to the controller. So that is uh, you have time. So one follow up question. How, can you summarize it very quickly for us as to how would this work with flex algo? Is it supposed to aid flex algo by giving more data from the network or is it there? It's not to aid flex algo. Flex algo is a part of the network slicing picture, right? It's uh, for the control plane and for the past computation. This is uh, uh, that's for the distributed past computation and that can be part of the constraints for the controller. And for the controller, it may need additional information which may be NRP specific. So this is a, this kind of information will be advertised using this approach. So they are uh, complementary. Thank you. Keitan, you're next. Hi, uh, hi, G. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, G, uh, is this information, the NRP information, uh, sourced in BGPLS from IGPs? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think it may be sourced from IGP or from local configuration. Okay. I think it's uh, not dependent on IGP. Okay, so if this information is not sourced uh, from IGP because the extensions are not 
yet specified in IGP, then right. you're saying they are sourced locally. Uh, you yes. know, again, uh, this is uh, probably something that we need to be careful about where all sorts of local configuration uh, from a router would get sourced into BGPLS. And my concern is where does the, where do we draw the line of what information gets sourced into BGPLS? Yeah, I understand your concern. Uh, I think we also have some other local configured information sourced to BGPLS, right? So maybe we can be, we need to be careful about that. But uh, if this is something related to uh, past computation, in my understanding, this is uh, BGPRS would be the right tool. Hey, G, just one follow-up question. This was actually my question behind the question. It will be nice to know what information are you sourcing and why, and be super clear about that so that um, it helps avoid any circular dependencies between okay. things like Flex Algo as well as BGPRS. Yeah, yeah, we can make that clear about the yeah. relationship with IGP. Yeah, okay, thank, thank you. you. So Keaton, sorry, we have to keep yeah, sorry. you. Okay, uh, I just had a quick this thing. I mean, if it's local information tomorrow, we could have the QoS policies that are used to realize NRP also get uh, pushed out via BGPLS. So that was my concern. Uh, and I'm adding to what Kayur was saying. Oh, yeah, we have a clicker. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Shu Ping from Huawei. And this is about dissemination of BGP flow spec rules for APN. Actually, you will find some of the proposals here also can be applied for some other technologies. Yeah, so first, a very brief introduction about APN. And uh, actually, technical speaking, that is uh, with APN in the data packets. Uh, there will be a APN header and that contains some information and with those information the network could be aware of some fine-grained service requirements and the APN header uh, could carry the APN ID and the, the optional APN parameters and if the data plane is IPv6 and the IPv6 extension headers could be used to carry this APN header so we also uh, newly posted this draft in six man and uh, it will contain more details about this data plane. And uh, here you could consider this as an APN framework and uh, there is an APN domain. And within this domain, and there are multiple policy enforcement points on nodes. On those nodes and the policies could be enforced and uh, based on certain rules. And so here the controller could be used to set up the BGP connection and with those uh, policy enforcement uh, points or nodes. And so here first, we need to define a new component. We need a new component type for APN. And this is the in encoding format and uh, there will be a mask and APN ID. So just to take this as an example, and uh, we have the APN ID being carried in the uh, data packets and also in the flow spec, we have this uh, mask and uh, as well as this uh, APN ID. So the mask and uh, in the flow spec will be used to indicate the base in the APN ID carried in the uh, packets. And uh, if, and this will, this part will be um, matched against the the APN ID uh, carried in the flow spec. So here in this example, you will see uh, it is a su successful match. So, and then the certain policies will be uh, enforced, for example, the traffic steering. And then it's about ordering. Actually, this is a more general, it's not only for APN, but uh, uh, we would like to hear more feedbacks or use cases. So first, so normally at a node, there will be multiple coexisting flow specs rules. So to a certain traffic flows, and uh, uh, there will be some existing flow spec rules, as well as, uh, I mean, take APN as an example, there will be also some of the flow spec rules for APN. And also APN ID is a structured ID, and different parts could be determined by different rules. 
So here our goal is to specify a grouping, uh, grouping mechanism for this uh, flow spec rules and uh, to uh, better categorize those coexisting rules and uh, make, make them to be applied to the flow in a desired order. And there are also some uh, requirements. So the ordering function uh, shouldn't depend on the arrival order of the flow specs via BTP. So here we need to define a grouping identifier OPIC extend community. And this is the encoding format. It includes the grouping ID as well as this uh, subgroup ID. And this is the uses principle, a lot of text, just uh, listen to me. And the we got this uh, a multiple coexisting flow, uh, uh, flow spec rules. And uh, we need to first categorize them into groups. And then further into each group, we need to further categorize the rules into subgroup. And then within each subgroup, we need to evaluate it. And based on the traffic action, uh, extended community is carried or not, and the T is set or not. So this part is the same as uh, previously defined. And then uh, between the different subgroups, so uh, the evaluation will, uh, the first uh, subgroup, and then when it finishes or stops, it will continues to examine the next subgroup if uh, there is still any. And then it will, uh, between the groups, so here is uh, if there is a one condition match uh, within one group, so the next uh, following groups will not be examined. So again, take APN as an example, and we see the rules, the existing rules may be based on the five tuple, as well as the APN rules, the new rules. So, and, and we first categorize them into groups and we got a group zero for the existing rules and a group one for the APN flow spec rules. And um, for the APN uh, ID has uh, three parts. So for the APP group ID that is based on five tuple is within one um, subgroup. And then the second subgroup is for the user group ID and then is for the reserve part. So how to uh, use the subgroup, the rules is the, ex, uh, the same as before. And between the subgroups is once you determine the APB group ID and then you need to check the second subgroup to determine the next part, the user group, and then the reserve part. And uh, if there is any condition is being matched in the group one, so that means you have the APN ID and the uh, the group zero will uh, stop. It won't be examined. And uh, here, we also define some uh, traffic filtering actions. And that is used to, to create the APN ID at the network edge, the APN domain edge, and encapsulate it in the, in the indicated outer tunnel header of a packet. And if it is a data plane is IPv6, and you could also indicate which uh, extension header you are going to use to encapsulate it. And here is that uh, we define four actions. So actually you could uh, uh, have uh, the, the entire APN ID and uh, you, you get it from the flow spec rules and then you just uh, encapsulate it in the outer tunnel. How you use the bit mask to pick up the part of the APN ID and then you encapsulate how you use the, this bit mask to uh, map against the incoming packets and to get the, the part of the APN ID you want to inherit and uh, encap, encapsulate it in the outer tunnel. And then that is, uh, you could also get part, part of the APN ID carried in the incoming packets and also part uh, from the flow spec rules and you stitch them to have this new APN ID. So any comments and suggestions and uh, in the technical wise and uh, to have us to refine the proposals and also the drafts will be very welcomed. Thank you.
So we have a robust queue. Andrew, you're first. Yeah, thanks so much, Andrew, outgoing um, AD. I'm a little confused here. APN failed multiple bots. It's not fully defined. And I question whether or not we are not jumping the gun here by bringing something like this to IDR before APN has consensus that the IETF wants to develop it and wants to move forward for it, something that multiple iterations have failed to show. So I question whether or not this graph may well have a use case once APN is properly defined. But as of yet, I don't see that as the case. And hence, I question whether or not this path is simply a little bit too early. OK, so um, technically speaking, and for this draft, and we think it's, uh, um, it's uh, in the technology-wise, uh, it's solid. And for the more use cases or deployments, and we also have uh, corresponding drafts. So you could refer to an also a side meeting. So um, people will have uh, more views on this. Robin, are you adding clarification to this question? Yeah. Uh, Robin from Huawei, I add some of these comments. Uh, the first one, in fact, before the uh, APN BOF, that's the APN use cases had well de uh, discussed in the APN side meeting and in the RTD working group and uh, achieve this the consensus to propose to set up uh, this the APN working group. So I mean, so we have the use cases. Uh, second one, I think that though this the uh, working group is not uh, uh, moved on, but we would like to uh, take this because we, we think that we uh, will go on to communicate with the AD and the working group chairs to if that the distributed the work in the different working group instead of we have in the specific working group. Andrew, any follow up? Looks looks like them. No, I, I think I think we just need to be very careful here that when something has, as I said, not managed to get the consensus of the IETF to proceed with development, that we don't end up in a situation where we start shopping things around in order to get something that has not had IETF consensus and has failed pops. And that really worries me. Right. And as a related follow up to the prior comments about Beach PLS features, this is very similar. This is work that uh, you know is not chartered elsewhere in IETF and in support of that. So we did have time during this IDR session to present, you know, uh, this is a draft. I believe towards Andrew's point, this was actually helpful because uh, the formats here are showing how APN would be used. And that's a thing that helps illustrate what the intent for APN is. Uh, so I think in that sense, it's good. Um, but I also agree with Andrew, we have to be very careful that you know, this is work that has not been adopted. You know, the, the amount of time that IDR will spend on this until that adoption has happened will be limited. Yeah, I disagree. Actually, we have been shopping, but uh, we finally decided we stopped. So, so now it's, uh, we have very solid solution, and especially in the IDR. And we need uh, the new type of component, and also we need uh, the extended community. So here is very technical. It's nothing about uh, shopping or whatever. We will carry out that uh, piece of policy discussion on the mailing list. Yeah, thank you. Dong Yu. And any other questions, please? OK, thank you for your presentation. This is Dong Yuan from ZT Corporation. And I've got two questions. And the first one is, um, what will be the appropriate granularity for flows back the specification rules disseminated and the second question is is there any uh, maybe different use cases for the rules disseminated for the APN midpoints or meeting or APN ha head end so that's, that's the question yes so and um, the first fine granularity 
yeah. The level of it, it depends depends on how you de determine it at the edge of the APN domain. And there will be some mapping and uh, some policies corresponding to it. Okay, I've, I've seen that in six main draft that there are three lanes of API identification. Yes. So is there any declination or suggestions in the definition of API identification? Yes, I mean about the lens, so, so it's up to the users and actually the operators and to decide uh, what size will fit uh, their network or their use cases. Okay, thanks. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dongyu. Uh, Robin, is okay. this an immediate follow-up to the question that just happened? If not, please wait in the queue. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my own question is related to the ordering things about the groups and subgroups. One of the challenges normal flow spec has right now is that the order is based on component IDs and the original use cases were ordering them specifically for IP DDoS. Mm -hmm. One of the discussion points for flow spec version two is to add explicit ordering to allow us to do something that is different than that order. And part of our discussion that we know that we need to have is how to allow for more fine grain ordering. The concern that I have based on your presentation is that even with you know, that course additional feature to allow user ordering, that uh, the group and subgroups are introducing much more complicated uh, sorting of the rules. Would you agree that's a correct observation? Yeah, actually we discussed and also with other experts and uh, we could discuss more, but currently we find this solution is more efficient. Yeah, so we, we could discuss more. Later. Okay, yeah. so my, my request, uh, the flow spec V2 work will get more focus uh, as the year you know, continues. Yes. Uh, in particular, the uh, sorting order as we're discussing, please review the current draft, which does discuss at least some portion of sort order and uh, comment upon that piece. Yeah, sure. We, Sue, you're yeah. next. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, mine goes on beyond that. Uh, one thing we were considering for flow spec V2 is ordering of actions. And because we are looking at ordering of actions, we were looking at wide community that could provide the order. In other words, I would do or action one and then action two. We'd like to have, as we go on in the next four months, we will be working on yes. going back and looking at that. We need your insight on True. this problem and to discuss the pros and cons. We still do need to wait for uh, general ITF, but we can work on these imp implementation pieces because we are looking at that. Good, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's still questions. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Xu Song? Uh, yeah, Xu Song from Huawei. Uh, actually, I'm glad to see the APM progress in the existing working group, especially the technical discussion like granularity. Um, also, in just uh, as Xu Ping has mentioned, we have a side meeting in the evening of Thursday. If you are interested, uh, interested in the use case deployment and other technical update, welcome to join the discussion then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, uh, Robin, did you wish to re-add yourself to the queue? Sorry, I get it's an issue to join this. Thank you. Uh, my uh, quick question uh, is similar as the uh, Xiaosong because regarding uh, this, the experts for you don't uh, this one, I think this regarding this, the uh, how to use this APN. In fact, we also already had the deployment cases. Maybe you can join the APN side meeting to have more discussion. So learn this, the how to use this one. Okay, thank you. You know, thank you for the vigorous discussion. That's exactly what we're gonna have happen during IDR itself. So our next presentation is on FC BGP. BGP. So we have a clicker over here. Okay. All right, could this get me ordered? Uh, hi folks. Uh, uh, this is Jota from Tsinghua University. I'm happy to share some recent progress about the FCBGP. Uh, so in last uh, year's FCBGP uh, discussion, we basically uh, discussed how uh, a new primitive 
called FCPGP to secure interdomain routing. It was in Prague, and we collected multiple feedbacks from the audience. And uh, then today I'm going to uh, present uh, the uh, program since then and how can we address these uh, uh, comments. <clears throat> Uh, so first of all, to keep everybody on the same page, I, I will have a very uh, quick recap about the FCBGP. Uh, so, uh, okay. so FCBGP is a uh, new secure uh, protocol that is trying to secure both the uh, control plane and data plane. Uh, sorry, the uh, material seems to be old, so I skipped that two pages, that's fine. Uh, so uh, on, on the control plane, uh, we have two uh, design goals. Uh, the first is in, in, a, in a case of full deployment, uh, we hope that FCBGP can guarantee that any BGP path authenticated by our protocol is the real path announced by the on-pass on ASs. In other words, it is infeasible for the adversary to claim that, the, that a forged, forged BGP path is authenticated. Uh, in the case of partial deployment, FCBGP is compatible with the uh, native BGP uh, and incrementally deployable. That means uh, FCBGP provides uh, strictly positive security benefits uh, for BGP paths where the, on, where the on pass ASs are not fully uh, deployed. And also, FCBGP has another component to the data play authentication, which is not part of which is not a book. You have a request to speak softer. Softer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, which is uh, uh, which is not part of today's discussion, so I can speak softer. Make it further. Uh, so FCBGP is built upon a primitive called uh, a verifiable routing com commitment. Uh, so, so suppose an F uh, ASB receives a BGP update uh, from its neighbor A for prefix P, and then ASB is using the following forwarding commitment to publicly certify its routing intent over the next hop to its ASC. Uh, the construction of, of FC is actually simple. It's it basically saying, okay, uh, I accept a route from my peer A, and I would like to extend this route to my peer C, and then, and then enclose this in its signature to prove its authenticity. So, F, so from the construction, we can see that as the FC, FCBGP adopts a per path late validation scheme uh, for validating the BGP, BGP pass uh, instead of the per pass uh, validation scheme that used in the BGP, uh, BGP SEC protocol, which is uh, 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 recursively assign the entire pass, uh, which we believe these two have two benefits. Uh, the first benefit is the uh, it has the same security guarantee in the full, in the case of full full deployment. Uh, we can prove that uh, both FCBGP and the uh, BGP sec will you know pro, will authentic, authenticate the entire pass if the if uh, in case of a full deployment, and also in the case of a partial deployment, we prove that FCBGP will have two will have more uh, security benefits. Uh, so things now, uh, that's all the recap. Uh, things now we have uh, 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 made some progress and uh, based on the comment, uh, comments from the audience uh, in Prague last year. And uh, today I'm gonna share the uh, FCBGP uh, protocol specification in detail. Uh, so first of all, let, let's, let me uh, start it with the FCBGP attribute. So it is a, uh, a optional, uh, transitive, uh, and uh, partial and extended lens. And the type of the, this pass attribute uh, is uh, pending for assignment. And the FC list is the list of FCs that were generated by all the on-pass ASs. So for each of the individual FCs, the format, its format is as follows. For, uh, it includes uh, three ASNs uh, to define the, uh, basically the AS hops, uh, define the uh, path plate. And also it includes a signature uh, to authenticate uh, this path plate. And also, there's a key that used to be used to can verify the signature. So this FC is self-certifying, basically. So because the because of the construction of the FC BGP, we believe we, we believe it is the fully compatible with BGP because instead of modifying the AS pass attribute, uh, we define a transitive uh, pass attribute uh, such that the legacy ASs can forward uh, this attribute without changing any protocol. Uh, the second, uh, I'm gonna discuss how each uh, FC BGP speaker are gonna proce uh, process this update message. So upon receiving a BGP update message uh, with, FC with FC BGP pass attribute specified, uh, an FC BGP uh, upgraded AS will perform the following three steps. Uh, the first one is it will, will authenticate the AS pass attribute just uh, inclu included, included in the update message. And the second one, it'll, it'll, based on that, it will perform the BGP pass, uh, BGP pass pass selection. And afterwards, it will extend this path uh, by ending its OFCs. 
uh, let's use this, this topology uh, to basically uh, uh, learn how, how we can verify the uh, AS pass attribute. So in this topology, uh, let's assume ASA and ASB and ASD, they were upgraded. And uh, the ASC and AS key are legacy. So we can see this pass uh, cross uh, multiple, uh, cross some undeployment zone here. So upon ASD receiving an update message from ASK, uh, it, will, uh, it will retrieve the uh, FC BGP uh, pass attribute and extract all the FC list and verify each individual FCs inside the list. The verification is actually similar. It just, it just makes sure uh, that the, uh, each pathlet authentic authenticated by the FC are consistent with uh, the AS pass and the signature is also correct. And we can see the ASC and AS key are legacy, so they can just ignore all the uh, past attributes and let, uh, let them go through, basically. Let, next, we move on to the BGP uh, best path selection. So FC BGP adds two priority rules in the second and third positions. Uh, so the first, uh, first position is still the highest priority is local preference. Uh, uh, the second one is the full path validation, which means the AS uh, can find a uh, FC for each individual pathlet on the pathlet. So each individual pathlet on this path is authenticated or certified by an FC. This, this we call this path is fully authenticated. Uh, the third uh, priority goes to the partial, uh, the partial path validation case in which uh, the AS can find a sufficiently long subpath that is authenticated. Uh, that's starting from the origin. So this is actually from our theory. We do some theoretical analysis to prove that uh, if, uh, the, uh, the, if there exists a subpass that is fully authenticated, that is also sufficiently long, then the entire pass is secure even if there is some legacy AS behind this uh, subpass. So we encourage people to read this, uh, read our proof to the, on the preprint that is available on the archive. And the third and the fifth, sorry, the uh, fifth and the fourth and fifth uh, priority they are the same. Well, FC, FC BGP does not touch that. Uh, because FC BGP is per pathlet, uh, there's actually the FC BGP speakers uh, must generate different update messages for different peers. So in this case, if uh, the AS, uh, ASE, uh, which is uh, uh, waiting to, prefers to announce multiple, uh, route, multiple route prefixes to its neighbor ASF, uh, it has to basically generate two different update messages to authenticate each of the routing intent. Uh, finally, I would like to discuss some deployment uh, status about FC BGP. Uh, so currently uh, we're trying to deploy this stuff in, the, in our network. Uh, the, the strategy or the principle here is that we want to strategically uh, deploy FC BGP capable devices uh, to avoid universally upgra upgrading all the routers, which is uh, very difficult to do. And currently we have built a overlay in China uh, crossing multiple ASs to test the to test the basic functionality of the ASB of the FCBGP there. Uh, so what we do is we deploy a virtual machine over there, and they speak the, uh, they communicate with with each other through an overlay to basically process to generate the F, uh, FC uh, and to process the, all, all these FCs. So the next step is to deploy the FC capable uh, prototype uh, or devices uh, uh, with the uh, real ASs and, and uh, prefixes. Uh, so that they can, so then we, they can start to propagate the actual BGP update that are carrying the FC information throughout these networks. Uh, in conclude, so FC BGP is a novel secure interdomain routing protocol. Uh, it is built upon a unified uh, preventive called the verifiable routing intent, and it is fully compatible with the BGP and incrementally deployable by offering stri strictly a positive security benefits. So for more, for more information, uh, feel free to refer to our uh, draft and also the papers available on the, uh, on the archive. Uh, that's, all I, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a robust queue. Kair is first. Hey, so Kair Patel, um, I looked at the draft. The draft is pretty light. You probably want to beef it up with the rule sets. I do get what you are saying, mm -hmm. uh, but it also says that for certain things like inserting an attribute FCBGP, if you don't have an AS prior to you, you insert AS zero. You want to beef up rule sets like that to say how can a rogue AS in middle uh, not, uh, you know, insert something like that and prove that 
it doesn't have anything in the front and hijack everything. That's number one. So you got to beef the rule sets very nicely. Number two, um, you're carrying an SKI public key inside that. Um, it'll be good to also explain in the draft what happens when the keys are refreshed. Um, the entire section is missing. And I bet you are probably riding on the fact that BGPSEC does it. So, hey, go refer to BGPSEC. But at least having that reference in the draft is important to say, please go read BGPSEC for this kind of things. Yeah? yeah. There are a number of things like that, and I'll send it out to you. But I think you want to beef that up. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It's very good uh, comments there. Thank you. My comment is just short after Kair's comment. When you say it's equivalently secure or it's as secure as BGP SEC, your draft needs to go a ways to prove that point. And I think after you do all of CARE's um, fixes, you might want to look on that one. Thank you. God's here. Thank you. Tobias. Hey, uh, Tobias Siebich, Max Planck Institute for Informatics. I was wondering what um, the impact of this would be in terms of, um, well, uh, FIP and RIP size, um, memory consumption on routers, convergence time, because I can imagine that doing that um, actually beefs that up. And I was also wondering whether the adjustments to the BGP path selection algorithm might introduce some issues with, well, legacy. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so the, uh, the the first question is like, I fully agree that this, this one gonna add some uh, additional pr uh, pr uh, processing overhead. That's why we, we the deployment strategy we hope to discuss here is we want to uh, deploy that uh, over the capable devices. Basically, it's a strategically selection. Not every up, not every router has to upgrade. So we we currently select trying to find some like major ASs. They have the sort of like, they already have this kind of software router stuff like that. They have very strong uh, processing capability to process this stuff. Uh, to to, a sec, sec, to the second question, the the legacy part, uh, because uh, the route selection of this legacy as should stay the same. So because they have nothing, uh, they do not understand the FC BGP attributes. They can follow their original path selection uh, priorities, like the you know local preferences and the sort of sort of aspects. They can they can basically ignore what is happening inside this uh, FC BGP attribute. So I'm next in queue, and uh, my first question builds on uh, Tobias's uh, point. I have the slide displayed in question. Anytime you change BHP route selection, you have a lot of dangers, as he's pointing out. Yeah. And you are inserting something very near the top, and it will be in a partial deployment within a single AS, which is where you'll run into these problems. If you do not have the path selection rules consistently implemented through the whole AS, you can end up with routing loops. So uh, we're, we're happy to work through the scenario with you. Uh, we're sort of trying to work on a, a small paper that describes the general problem because these things come up every time people touch BGP. Uh, so this will be the first problem you run into. Uh, my second question, sorry. I will actually requeue myself for the second question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nangang. Hello, uh, Nangang from Huawei Technology. Uh, uh, I think that the work is interesting. Uh, I have two questions. The first, uh, uh, how did you implement the FC BGP based on what uh, open source uh, project? Uh, using Quagga right now. Quagga. Yeah, m most, most of the code, code base is on Quagga. OK. Yeah. And my second question is, uh, can you go to uh, page 11? Yeah, about the uh, yeah, past selection. Uh, why don't you uh, take the same best path selection as ROV uh, when we uh, we, we can also get the validity state of uh, rules by connecting our way or as far valid verification. So why don't we take the same path selection method? Uh, yeah, I think that's a very good 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 session. I can I will talk to you later after this. I think it's very good 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 session. Like as a mention about this uh, uh, BGP okay. uh, path selection priorities. Thank you, Maria. 
Okay, well, hello, Maria Cicinek. Hello from Europe. It's six o'clock here. Um, I'd like to ask uh, whether uh, this is actually disabling route server transparency. Because uh, if you have a transparent route server between two different ASAs, or, or between the many different ASAs, mm -hmm. you basically force uh, all the networks to originate numerous updates for each of the of the local asns uh, once uh, one after another uh, while now you are just uh, in a, just sending one and also i'd like to uh, i'd like to second uh, jeffrey's uh, uh, loop check uh, you have to check whether the loops do happen or not thank you thank you i got you uh, so yeah so your, your second question is uh, God? I met back with you. Here is next. <laughs> okay. I, I know you're going to present that side of the yeah, yeah, So right. I think uh, quite a lot of these questions that folks are asking here will be solved once you look at BGP sec and sort of get the needed data into this trap. Uh -huh. I have a stupid question that I wanted to ask you. Uh, what happens? So you have created an overlay today in china yeah that's basically to, for testing to, to test it and yes. figure it out yes. using vms uh -huh. and you said that that would be the strategy to go forward moving forward um if you deploy that my question is should you do something like that which is very interesting how will you know the routers in the forwarding path that a given path is hijacked uh, so let me first clarify the overlay. So the, the, the overlay basically stuff is is only to test our software currently works. Like yeah, the yeah. so the, the the future strategies that we still want to we, of, of course we don't want to use overlay, we want to the actual things to propagate through the stuff. So in, in terms of your question, how the pass is hijacked, it's not the responsibility of, of, of FCVGP. So FCVGP is solely telling uh, ask the ASS to certify its routing intent. So if the someone you know like the detector or monitor feels like okay this product does not uh, comply with the intent then there's a problem. But this in terms of this protocol does not really you know. No, I get that. But mm -hmm. how are you going to influence the forwarding routers to say, hey, this path does not comply, and therefore a policy decision should be taken whether to drop that path or depref that path, so forth and so on. Uh, maybe through this uh, uh, path selection part. I, like if you were, uh, you know, seeing a fully authentic pass, you can accept it. I think what you're saying is you will have to deploy this on the forwarding routers eventually. Yeah, kind of. And then this question comes up to say, well, what's the scale performance? And yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to figure it out because like currently we are working on the devices there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the question I remembered on your slide 13 about your topology. So your overlay this is not real internet. You haven't grabbed an attribute that you're leaking yeah. to the outside world, yes? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Tom, you're next in queue. Uh, Tom Strix, Cloudflare. Uh, really interested in, in what you're kind of trying to do. You seem to be relying on RPKI in one way or another. Uh, is this going to fail open or fail closed? Uh, so because specifically if Afrinic, for example, yeah. has issues or uh -huh. IDNIC has issues, uh -huh. I don't want my BGP sessions to start flopping, and uh -huh. I have to deal with a bunch of spurious updates. Uh, that's that's a very very that's a very good, very great question. I I would say so. By by for open, you mean you mean if uh, uh, if the RPK does not work, I should stop doing this kind of thing, or it... yeah, basically if if. if... I can't fetch the RPKI certificates. Yeah, my sessions should still remain up. Yeah, I think that's the yeah that's the plan. You sh if the you know the uh, RPKI session you can is is not up, you should feel open. Just, just ignore all the stuff over there. Can that be added to the draft? Yeah. Thank you very much. Very good, very good comments. And Tobias, you're the last for this question session. Um, Tobias Sudich, uh, MPI Informatics again. Um, I, I was wondering how this interacts with having multiple paths and asymmetric routing in ASs. So if I, if I just think about like my model train hobby AS that has three pops and all three pops might have different routes and paths and the reverse paths might actually all look the same because I might be pairing with that AS uh -huh. somewhere. Uh -huh. so, so how does that interact with the forwarding commitments? My, just one of my pops kick out all the return path data because, well, it's not what they think they see. Yeah, that might be the case where you cannot certify this 
uh, thing. Like for instance, like there's there is about some situations like in, in terms of the traffic engineering, it is difficult to certify like the, because it's multi-path stuff. Both paths I preferred. So in that case, you just basically ignore that thing because anyways, we does not require a fully path authentication anyhow. Yeah. It's like the per hop stuff. Did, did I answer your questions or we can, we can discuss later. Yeah, sure. Okay. Again, thank you for vigorous uh, presentation. Oh, we look forward to seeing more about this and Cider App certainly will have opinions. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm done. Okay. Uh, so uh, with apologies to the final two pre uh, presentations, I misordered you know, this presentation ahead. Uh, the next presentation will be on, uh, again, FlowSpec you know, for destination IP community filters. Tian Ho. Hello, everyone. I'm Tian Ho from Huawei. Today, I'm going to talk about destination IP community filter for BJP flow specification. We propose a new BJP flow spec component type to support community level filtering. Next slide, please. Uh, in RFC 8955 and RFC 8956, BJP flow specification is proposed to specify the distribution of traffic filter policy via BJP. BJP flow specification policies have a match condition that may be an tuple match in a policy and an action that modifies the packet and forwards or drops the packet. Traditional BJP flow specification component types include the source prefix or destination pre prefix, source port or destination port, IP protocol, and so on. Next slide. In practice, we need many BJP flow spec rules to control the traffic. Here is an example. IP prefix 11 belongs to AS1, prefix 31 and 32 belong to AS3, prefix 41 and 42 belong to AS4. In AS2, router 1 wants to use BJP flow spec for redirecting all traffic from AS1 to AS3 and AS4. The engineer wants the traffic first go to the router 3. As we can see in this example, we need at least four BJP spec policy, uh, spec rules to achieve this goal. Each rule represents the source prefix and the destination prefix of the traffic. If AS3 and AS4 have more prefix, we need more flow spec rules. A huge number of ACL entries are occupied. Next slide, please. But what if we use BJP community as a traffic filter? Suppose AS3 and AS4 announced the BJP updates to AS2 with the same BJP community, one clone one, and the destination prefix of those BJP updates are all prefix they have. So we only need one BJP flow spec rule to redirect all traffic from AS1 to AS3 and AS4. And it will save lots of ACL entries. And we receive a valuable comment from Jeff. Uh, Jeff thinks the BJP communities are uh, unstable for B uh, BJP flow spec rules. We think that those BJP com communities are specially used to generate BJP flow spec rules. They are planned in advance and will be ensured to be present when used. Uh, compared with the destination IP origin AS filter, this destination IP community filter is more uh, flexible and uh, more suitable for the, especially for the IBDP scenario. Next slide, please. Here is the flow specification encoding for destination IP community filter. It is quite similar to other component types of BGP flow spec. It consists of a type, an operator, and a value. The number of the, the type is TBD. The operator includes end of least bit, end bit, length, less than bit, greater than bit, and equality bit. The value is a four bytes destination IP community value. The next slide, please. Uh, in the next steps, we will add a session to describe a flow spike world two extension of a destination IP community filter, and we will keep improving our draft 
by discussion via emails. Okay, that's all. We are happy to answer the questions. Thank, thank you for your presentation. This is Sue Harris. I have a couple questions to make sure I understand your presentation and your draft. You are proposing filtering on something in the routing system of community rather than the normal flow spec, which has just filters that you might put in a firewall. Do I understand your draft and your presentation? Yeah, yes, it's a uh, um, control plan information, BJP community. Yes, uh, we want to use uh, this this information to uh, uh, as a BJP flow stack rule. And how does that apply to the forwarding that flow spec normally uh, applies uh, to? I'm I'm missing uh, how it works inside of how it relates to the other flow spec V1 and V2 sections. Uh, yes, BJP should. Uh, uh, deliver the is uh, uh, BJP community uh, to FIB. It's uh, it is uh, it is need needed to to deliver this information. So we can use uh, BJP community to uh, filter traffic. So uh, my question will build on Sue's. Uh, so on the mailing list, the the first question I'd had was towards the instability of communities. So you've addressed that, thank you. The second piece that Sue is discussing is you're building flow spec filtering state from BGP routes. And I think this is at least clear. Uh, Robert Rashuk on the mailing list expressed concern about this. I referred back to the procedures for you know, eBGP flow spec where validation uses the rib so this type of interaction between flow spec and the rib you know, exists a little bit today. The thing that is very different that I'm not sure uh, you are considering appropriately is that if you're having your flow spec state generated from your rib, basically you're saying, you know, match any route that you learn uh, that has this community and generate a flow spec rule for it, you are actually generating the same amount of flow spec state that is matching your rib no, uh, criteria. So while you are potentially simplifying flow spec configuration, the amount of flow spec state in the system actually can be you know, very large. And it also potentially can be out of the control of the you know, flow spec software, because you know, unless you have limits on the number of entries created, you are under the amount of uh, routes, the amount of flow spec filters that will be created will be on the same order as the number of BGP routes with that BGP community. Yes, yes, that's a good question. Uh, we think that uh, uh, we should uh, limit uh, the uh, uh, destination IP community filter uh, in, uh, in case of uh, uh, overwhelm BGP flow specification, um, such, uh, such as we uh, only limit uh, uh, hundreds, hundreds of uh, community filter. Uh, so my recommendation uh, is to take that feedback and do some scale analysis versus your scenarios versus the number of flow spec routes that will be uh, created. Yes, yes, we we will uh, receive this this feedback. Yes. Okay. Our final question for this presentation is from Ketan. Uh, hi, Ketan Talaulikar, Cisco. Uh, actually, I was, um, I think, builds upon Jeff's thing, uh, which is on routers. The actual scarce resource is the rules that are in the forwarding. Um, probably not so much the flow spec routes in BGP uh, itself. And uh, <clears throat> even if there were to be some limits or restrictions, the nature of flow spec is that uh, probably for DDoS or some security use cases, if we could do some and not all, and you know when where do we put a limit? What is allowed? I think it starts to become tricky. So uh, I have concerns uh, about this. I mean, it's the idea sounds good, but 
the practicality is a bit uh, concerning. Uh, at least uh, this should be captured is what I would give as a feedback. Oh, okay. okay, thank you, Ketan. We have a response? Um, I, I'm not quite uh, understand this question. Maybe we can uh, discussion via email. Uh, I, I will pass it on the mailing list. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Thank you, Ketan. Thank you, Tian Ho. Um, our final presentation for today, Nangang with uh, BGB flow spec for source address validation. Hello, Nangong from Huawei Technology. Do you have uh, the, which one? Okay, great. Uh, the topic of my presentation is BGP flow spec for source address, address validation. We propose to extend the flow spec to support matching uh, interfaces. Uh, some rules can be used to check the source addresses of packets. If the packets with a specific source address arrive uh, the router from uh, valid interfaces, the packets will be considered as valid. If the packets with the specific source address uh, arrive the router at uh, invalid interfaces, the packets will also be considered as uh, invalid. Uh, there are some related discussions in the subnet working group where authors can think that uh, uh, an additional tool is needed to disseminate some rules to facilitate some management and uh, improve some accuracy. Uh, BGP flow spec is a good tool for traffic filtering or monitoring. Uh, it can support uh, matching source prefix and all. And uh, in this document, it's proposed that uh, flow spec can be extended to support uh, matching interfaces then we can use the flow spec to disseminate uh, some rules. Uh, we, should, we have received some comments from the interim meeting last month. Uh, we presented our previous design that is a, a sub interface set extended community. Uh, comment one is from Sue. Uh, he, she asked, uh, it, what, uh, is the interface a filter or an uh, action? And uh, comment two is from Jeff. Uh, some of comments of Jeff overlapped with uh, Sue's uh, comments. And uh, it's also mentioned that uh, the space defined here may be not uh, enough, not large enough uh, in very large networks. And uh, we updated the drops uh, and uh, hope the drops can respond to the comments. In our updated draft, we propose a new component uh, named as incoming interface set. Uh, the encoding is uh, a type followed by a, one or more pairs of numeric operator and the value. The numeric operator is uh, encoding is defined in RFC 8955. Uh, and uh, the value field is defined in this draft. Uh, in the value field, we define group identifier. The identifier indicates a specific set of interfaces. Uh, it can be configured by network or the administrator. Uh, if the group identifier equals zero, it will be zero group identifier. It's a special identifier. Uh, it means uh, any other interfaces on the target router except uh, the interfaces indicated by non-zero group identifiers. Uh, the identifier can be one, two, three, or eight octics. It depends on the length field in the numeric operator. Uh, there are two flags in the group identifier field. The first flag is flag V. It's the most significant bit in the group identifier field. The, the bit can, if the bit is set, the identified interface set uh, is valid for the source prefix contained in the source prefix com component. If it's unset, the interface set would be invalid for the specific uh, source prefix. 
Uh, the second flag is uh, R, is a reserved bit. Uh, it maybe can be used for future, in the future. Uh, and uh, it's uh, need to be mentioned that the bits uh, less than, greater than, and equal uh, in the numeric operator can also be used to match a range of group identifiers, like uh, greater than group ID1 and uh, less than group ID2. Here is an example. If we want to disseminate a sub role like uh, incoming interfaces uh, with group ID ranging from 1 to 20, are valid for the packets from the prefix with slash 24. Uh, and other local interfaces are invalid for the packets. We can disseminate uh, the sub rule by encoding this informa the information in a flow spec LRI. In the LRI, we have two components. The first component is a source a prefix component. This is the same as uh, that in RFC uh, 8955 or 56. And the second component is uh, incoming interface set. In this set, we can uh, indicate that uh, the group ID ranging from 1 to 20 are valid for the source prefix. And, and uh, uh, we will indicate zero group identifier to indicate that uh, local interfaces, other local interfaces are invalid for the source prefix. Okay, in this draft, we, uh, we are trying to extend the BP flow spec uh, to make it uh, support uh, match, matching incoming interfaces. Of course, our rule dissemination is just a use case. It can also be used in other scenarios where uh, incoming interfaces are needed to be matched. Uh, comments are welcome. Kiru Patel, quick question. Uh, you are assuming for this draft to work, the entire uh, calculation is not done in line on the routers. The controller itself does uh, the SAB calculation and figures it out that you've hit a hijack and it's coming from a given router and therefore you want to install the flow spec rule, correct? Uh, yeah, the, the, the rules can be generated on controller yes but my point is if it's done in line then you won't need this extension uh we can generate the rules in the controller and the controller can disseminate these rules uh i i the rules can also be generated on routers uh, and the bp flow spec can be used as an additional method to make it uh, more accurate because we can collect more information from a uh, controller database, maybe. One last comment. If the SAPnet extensions are implemented on the forwarding routers itself, and they detect that a traffic coming in through a certain port is malicious, a DOS attack, then they would do this functionality locally in which case you won't need this extension. Is that correct? It's just a provider a method, the method. Jeff has uh, speaking two roles. Uh, role number one, chair, uh, you know, using flow spec as a way to do the filtering, I know is one of the discussion points in the SAV networking group. Uh, the VRF mode is also a point of discussion so my question to you first is, uh, you know, there's more than one technique. Uh, is there intent to have a second bit of feature to tie these, uh, the VRF mode together with the flow spec mode for the source address validation? Uh, sorry, <laughs> can you repeat your question? Uh, let me take that one to the mailing list and also disclosure of the room. We will be discussing this after the session as well. So let's you know, discuss it after the session. So that's thing number one. Uh, second thing as uh, one of the authors for the interface set, uh, you know, internet draft, one of the reasons we did not put the interface set into the NLRI itself is that uh, interface IDs are very tightly scoped to a single AS. 
you know, the numbers have very, very, very local meaning. So we chose, uh, in our case, to put it in t inside of the extended community to allow it to change from one AS to another. I, I know this is not the primary use case for source address validation. Uh, this is intended to be single AS work, but uh, we should look at that use case for multi AS uh, for this feature if Savnet is going to be looking at that as an option. Do you mean to control the scope of the uh, propagation of the information? Uh, so as an example, AS number one, interface ID may mean uh, interface index one might mean customer. AS number two, uh, the interface uh, may mean for the same value peer. So the semantics differ. If it's in the NLRI, NLRIs are not allowed to change from one AS to the next one, but communities can. Okay, we will think about it. Thank okay. you. So you had a question? Sa same point more to the working group. This, uh, this interface uh, flow spec action or filter is something we will be working on in the next four to five months. So if you are interested in this, please contact the chairs. And again, we will begin some discussion r right after the meeting. Thank you. Okay, we will come back. Thank you. Thank you for presentation. This was the last session. We have one point of order before we are completely finished. You know, uh, actually a couple. Uh, we will be meeting on Friday again for another couple of sessions and uh, presentations. So we we'll hope to see you then. Uh, second point of order: We are at the you know transition of our previous AD, Andrew Alston. Uh, his work is now being taken over by John Scudder. John, if you could stand or wave and be recognized. And could we have a hand for Andrew for all the good work he's done for us? And thanks to the chairs. Um, it was a pleasure working with you and the whole working group. Um, time is much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So enjoy your vacation such that it is. We will see everybody else on Friday, hopefully. Have a good day. So, where are we? He said today. I, I have a so about the question, uh, so how, 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 how,